Oh, hello. Welcome to the 2013 Hundy Challenge. Today we're going to be discussing Getting High in Jamaica by Hugh Laurie. This was an interesting little book. Um, it was interesting coming on the heels of uh, Wide Sargasso Sea, which I read the other week. Um, I've explained before, I don't have any real particular system that I've been using and putting these together, just kind of my whims of the week. But it just so happens that these two weeks or three weeks in a row, um, I somehow picked up books having to do with the Caribbean, um, the colonial Caribbean, if you will, which is not an era that I'm familiar with. Uh, neither of them were really the era of pirates, which uh, maybe I know a little bit more about but um this uh high wind in jamaica was i think in like the late 19th century and they even talk about how pirates were kind of um passe at that point when you think about something that's uh like in a, just kind of like a zombie industry like uh you know i hate to say it but maybe like you know the music industry or you know something that's just it's just gone on for so long a certain way and even though you know that it can't go on that way anymore and that things are going to change, you know, the infrastructure is still there. So it's about piracy after the era of piracy. Um, so basically what happens is the the high wind in Jamaica, I guess it's, I suppose it's meant to be a little bit ironically titled. Um, but there's a, a family of Creoles. Um, whites who have been in Jamaica for a couple of generations um, consider themselves uh, uh, Jamaican. Well, actually, I guess it was just that the kids were... You know what? It was just one generation because the parents were born in England. The kids were mostly born in Jamaica except for, I think, the oldest. So the kids considered themselves Creoles. And uh, the beginning of the story... I sort of thought it was just going to be like Wide Sargasso Sea, like about, you know, living in Jamaica in that era. Because the first couple of chapters, like the first maybe like two or three chapters, you know, they talk about some of the like myths of the island, like the, the duppies, the kind of the ghost with his head on backwards. Um, and, uh, you know, they live through an earthquake and they play with the little, the little kid, the local kids and... Uh, you know, so at first it seems like it's just going to be like wide sargasso sea, like, oh, what was life like in Jamaica at this time? But then the high wind comes, and the high wind is just, it's just kind of a storm that just kind of blows over. But the parents, being parents, uh, are like, oh, well, we can't raise our kids in this kind of society. You really get the impression that the high wind was not a, as big of a deal as the parents made it out to be. I, I think it's kind of, you know, meant to be ironically titled. Um, so they decide to take these kids, there's maybe like four or five kids, and uh, put them on a boat and send them to England and, you know, have them raised somewhere safe, somewhere proper, all that good stuff. So the kids get no further than Cuba. I don't think they even made it to Cuba before it's just like a, a calamity of errors and uh, they're captured by pirates and brought aboard a pirate ship. Um, now these pirates are not at all your bloodthirsty swashbuckling you know not what you think of pirates they're down on their luck piracy it's past its prime um they're kind of like the last dying gasp of you know buffoons who still think that piracy is going to work in this era um and they're just they're so dumb and uh, almost kind of you almost want to say good-hearted, but there's there's only so much you can consider a pirate to be good-hearted. But, like, they don't kill anybody, you know. They, they'd they rather, like, beat a carpet. Like, instead of beating a person, they'll, like, beat a carpet and make you think that they're beating a person and, and you know, dumb shit like this. So when the kids get captured by these kind of buffoonish pirates, the pirates just meant to use them at, for, like, a few minutes as, like, a bargaining chip to keep – the kids ship you know on the straight and narrow and then the ship that the kids were supposed to be on just like takes off they assume that the pirates killed the kids and the pirates are like what are we supposed to do with these fucking kids um so the book kind of throughout 
is just like a comedy of errors. But there's also it's also kind of sad watching the kids lose their innocence, um, because they're varying degrees of ignorance and to some extent stupidity, and to some extent just circumstance. Um, the one girl ends up. Uh, she becomes the only one on the boat, as it turns out, that kills somebody. When she's ill, and the pirates capture this vessel and bind and bind and tie up the uh, captain and put him in, you know, they just stick him in. Oh well, we'll throw him in with the girl who's sick. And as that guy starts to escape, she goes down and kills him, and the other kids shun her, you know. And uh, she kind of goes a little bit mad almost. Um, another one of the kids actually dies. And you watch how the kids – it's not even like they're like consciously closing ranks. But the kids, they just don't want to deal with the fact that, that one of their brothers or you know friends – they weren't all brothers and sisters. They were like two groups of, of families. Um, that this one kid, John, had died by accident had nothing to do with the pirates. He was just being an idiot, climbing a tree or something and fell out of a tree. Um, and the kids all just like, they just shut off that part of their brain. And it's like, who's John? They just completely block him out. It's kind of like a scary thought psychologically that, that children are capable of that kind of, you know, self deceit. And yet it's very human, you know, it's very humanizing that, that the kids would do that without any kind of real supervisory parent figures, you know, they just are going to try and figure stuff out on their own. They try to emulate the pirates, sadly, because the pirates are such sad sacks. Um, I, I, you know, I, I always say I never read the introductions or anything, but I caught the last page of this introduction that said this was like a better version of um, Lord of the Flies, because Lord of the Flies really slaps you in the face with all of its, you know, super subtle metaphors um and i i kind of see what they're talking about you know this is kind of a loss of innocence without any like finger pointing like human society is, is wrong you know like it's a very like um it's a little more subtle in its themes i guess i would say um but you know talking about all these themes and shit i might be understating the fact this is a ridiculously funny book and engaging. Just the things that have like, like they try to get a monkey drunk so that they can cut off its tail because the tail has gangrene, and just ridiculous, just funny and engaging. And that's something that's really been missing from this list a lot of the time for me, anyway. Is they're not like adventure stories. Nothing happens. I'm so used to reading modern books where they, you know, it's like action first, and then maybe we'll fill you in on background, and if we have time, maybe we'll stick in some themes. Um, this book really had a lot more stuff going on than I've been used to in this challenge, so definitely one of the top books, for me anyway, that I've read so far this year. Thanks for tuning in. Next time, we will be talking about uh, J.P. Don Levy's Ginger Man.